Welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Sarah McDooling, the YA and Children's Category Manager, Booktopia, and I'm here today with Hannah Armstrong, Fiction Assistant Category Manager, and we are both delighted and, I must confess, somewhat bored and starstruck to be talking today with best-selling author C.S. Picard. Kat, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Now, for all the people listening, would you mind just telling them a little bit about your upcoming YA fantasy, Dark Rise? Uh, Dark Rise is like my agonised love letter to all of those English pastoral fantasies that I read growing up, like Lord of the Rings and The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper and, um, you know, the Narnia books by C.S. Lewis, which with whom I, I share a C.S., um, <laughs> And, um, but, you know, uh, I love those books, even though they kind of excluded me, you know, um, they, um, the, the hero was just so often, um, a kind of a, a straightforward English lad trudging across the marshland, eating hot buttery toast. Um, and the villain was always this, the sort of strange outsider, the, 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 the person sort of over yonder um, with who I identified a lot more. Um, so I was really interested in taking one of those classic battles of good and evil that I, I read in my childhood and then flipping it on its head, um, drastically destabilizing it so that the reader is left kind of white knuckling it like, oh my God, what is going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> Very accurate description of how I felt reading the book. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> Yeah, if that was your intention, you definitely pulled it off. I was like in complete like heart racing till the very end of that book, especially the last like maybe third. Um, I wanted to ask you, this is your YA debut. Um, I've read like all of your work. Was it difficult to kind of write for an adult, like going from an adult audience to a young adult, a young adult audience? And was that like, what was different for you? Um, I think that so, um, yeah, so my first series, Captive Prince, is, um, how can I put it, very adult <laughs> indeed. Um, yes. But, um, <laughs> but for Dark Rise, you know, when I was growing up, my kind of adolescence and teen years, I'd say, well, childhood through to my adolescence and teen years, I'd say it was the time that books were really the most alive to me. Um, that was the time that I would just escape into fiction and it was at its most immersive um, and so I think that while I've been writing, there's always been a part of me that's been trying to reconnect with that self um, that could just lose themselves in books for hours and days at a time. That's what drew me to writing in YA. Um, and I think, um, I think going into it with that mentality, um, you know, the, the transition was not so difficult. You're kind of writing out of a younger, a younger self that you can then access. Um, you've done a thing in this book that I love when I encounter it, but I imagine must be really difficult, but maybe not. I'm going to ask you. Um, this story that you've written, and I'm going to keep things really spoiler free and keep this like broad, but the story is underpinned and driven a lot by a really epic past like a history that has been created this world and often when you particularly in fantasy when you encounter stories that sort of come with this rich back history um, you know there's ways that the authors have to try and weave that in and it often means a lot of flashbacks and things but you just seamlessly wove a huge history into your story and I just wanted to ask if that was challenging for you? It was, it was very challenging. Dark Rise is far and away, like levels of difficulty harder than anything that I'd written before. It was, it was a huge undertaking. Um, I really studied, um, you know, <laughs> I think for a lot of, of writers, we're, we're just autodidacts and we read, read books and we des desperately try and reverse engineer techniques from, from other authors. So for me, the books that I, I kept going back to were Lord of the Rings um, and then Harry Potter as well, um, not necessarily for story inspiration, but to look at how those authors managed to communicate such a huge 
just a huge like encyclopedia's worth of in information through to the reader without ever bogging it down. Um, and you know, once once you look at it from a through a craft lens, and I'm sorry if this is getting a little bit too into the weeds, but you can see that they're constantly using a series of different, very sophisticated um, techniques. Um, which I'll just name check a few. Like Tolkien was the master. Um, even something as simple as his naming system. Um, you know, if you think of something like um, the Mines of Moria. Not only does it have that fantastic alliteration, but you can tell from the name that they're mines. Like you don't have to explain it; it's embedded into the name. Um, if you think of um, Elrond half elven, <laughs> you know he's half elven, <laughs> elven from his name. Like it doesn't need to be separately explained. I think Star Wars does that kind of um, hidden world building really well as well. If you think of a lightsaber, you can tell what it is uh, without explanation, simply from like a clear naming system. Um, or, uh, or even a Jedi Knight, the word Knight tells you something about what they are, a fighting order. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, I, I definitely did a lot of work kind of unpacking the techniques of, of those sort of great fantasy writers that had gone before um, in order to try and impart what it turned, like, as you say, it's two, two stories, two worlds worth of world building in one book without without uh, letting it bog the story down. Uh, that was fascinating. Please feel free to take us into the weeds as often <laughs> as you'd like. <laughs> um, I, I, it, it's one of those things that you don't think about until after you've read the book. While I was reading the book, I was so immersed in the story. Um, but it wasn't until I got to the end of it that I was just like, how, how, is, that, how is it possible to have put so much in and have it flow and not, you know, I know so much about what went on in before the story even begins. So um, you've mentioned a few of the books that influenced you, but um, can I ask where that first initial little spark of inspiration came from for this, these particular characters in this world? Uh, I think it was a, a combination of things. So, um, you know, I, I grew up reading Tolkien and, um, and he, he was such the dominant influence, like it, through the 80s and then even into the 90s, even kind of into the early 2000s. He was just the, such the dominant influence over all of fantasy. Um, and the, the first writer that I saw kind of really take him on um, in a way that they did not, simply collapse under his influence um, was George R. R. Martin with Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. um, and it was because he was not um, following in the footsteps of Tolkien, but fitting himself into the negative space around Tolkien. Like what if the past was not just a bucolic pastoral fantasy and life was instead short, hard and brutal? What, what if the hero was not destined to win, but um, you know, it was just a chaotic game of chance who was gonna come out on top? Um, but one of the reasons that Game of Thrones, I think, works so well is also it's in constant communication with Tolkien. We would not find Game of Thrones so shocking and fresh if we didn't have those assumptions of what a fantasy was already embedded within us, thanks to um, Lord of the Rings. Um, but so, you know, when I looked at Tolkien, I think one of the things that I wanted to engage with um, is that, that kind of like biological determinism that he has where where like an, an elf will always be good and an orc will always be evil. But I was, I was very interested in like, what if an orc could find a heroism, do a heroic deed, you know, and what if an elf could betray you? Um, and, um, and so I, I wanted to take on kind of one of those kind of classic fantasy um, stories um, to kind of craft it in, in that old, almost old fashioned classic style. Uh, and then play around with it, flip it on its head. So that, that was the idea that I, I came into Dark Rise with. But then at the same time, uh, I think two things happened. One was that I, um, you know, Lord of the Rings did fall out of fashion. <laughs> kind of it started to become old fashioned. Um, I think one of the things that is old fashioned about it is that the enemy is always without and never within. And that was something that I also wanted to look at as well. 
Um, but when I reread it, uh, as I was starting to write Dark Rise, I was really struck by the speech that um, that Gandalf gives to Frodo, where he's, um, Frodo says, I wish I had not lived to see such times. And Gandalf says, that's not for us to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time we have. And that felt so contemporary, <laughs> so fresh and so relevant to um, the experiences that we're all going through in the world right now. And I thought like, oh, it's, it's come around again. You know, it's time again for a story about fighting uh, a, a oppressive force and what, what it means to, to fight. Um, but the other thing was that I, I went to the Louvre um, and there's something so disturbing about museums, you know, all those displaced remnants of forgotten lives. I started to think about the idea of a long dead magical world. And then that combination of factors combined together into what would eventually become Dark Rise. I love hearing you talk about um, your inspirations, like especially your kind of old fantasy inspirations for this book, because especially Lord of the Rings, that definitely came through. I think I said to Sarah halfway when I was reading this, this like epic horse chase scene um, when they're heading to like the hall for the first time. And all I could think about was Lord of the Rings. And then there was that bit, there's like the one ring and there's that like, yeah, like wholesome intrepid hero. Um, I think if that was your intention, you definitely pulled it off. It's like an homage, but it also subverts it completely. Um, something I wanted to ask you with those kind of old epic fantasies that we all know and love, there's certain characters and types of people that are often left out of those narratives. Um, and I know that you're an advocate for queer characters and gender diverse characters like within um, literature. So I wondered if you could just speak on for a little bit about like why that's important to you. And especially when we consider this being a YA fantasy. Yeah, even before um, I, I speak to characters, I think as Australians, when we, when we read fantasy in that classic style, some part of us knows that something is up. You know, it's so full of the um, unconscious European id. There's the thick forests with big, enormous beasts. We don't have that here. You know, we've got wide open spaces and all our deadly creatures are really small. Everyone's constantly sieging a castle, but we don't have any land borders here. Um, uh, the North is always chilly and cold, but that's not the case here, you know, our North is hot. <laughs> we don't have an ice wall in the North. Um, and, um, you know, fantasy is so concerned with like sword fighting and big land battles, it, it, it almost makes us as Australians forget we never had a medieval period here. Um, so we've just imported these European ideas wholesale. There's something very colonial about that. Um, even the names of, heroes, you know, I, I named my ca character, main character, Will, which is what these characters are often called. Uh, if they're not called Will, then they're called Harry. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, that it, that means, you know, England's great conquerors, William the Conqueror, King Henry V, now they're our heroes too. That's the colonial aspect of stories. Um, so, but, but yeah, so the, then the other thing that I, I um, as a, as a queer kid growing up, I, I never saw myself in any of these stories. Um, as, as many of us um, from different backgrounds or identities never really saw ourselves. Um, you know, the three of us, even as women, if we're at the Battle of Helm's Deep in Tolkien, we'd be locked in the caves with the women and the children. We wouldn't be fighting with the heroes on the front. Um, so, um, you know, I think that um, genre fiction, for me, it's the place where we create all of our modern myths. Um, we've moved on from the period where we get our heroes from the classics or history, and we've replaced like Hercules with Harry Potter. And so as a writer of genre fiction, I'm, I'm aware that I'm part of a system of cultural production where I'm producing heroes, I'm producing myths um, that, um, you know, teach people um, who, you know, to aspire to, um, who, who to listen to, um, whose views to ignore, whose views to listen to, um, even teach people who, who's human and, and who's the enemy. Um, and so I think it's very important that um, 
when you're writing heroes that you you write a set of heroes that um, you know it shows everyone that they can have a heroic self um, that gives everyone a chance to aspire i was really interested um i was really influenced by a comment um from the writer juno diaz uh where he said um you know we've got this idea that like a monster can't see itself in the mirror you know like a like a vampire can't see itself in the mirror um but that in fact it's when you can't see yourself that you start to feel like a monster like it's it's almost the other way around and in, when you when you look around and, and nothing in the wider culture is reflecting you then you can start to feel monstrous or a villainous or just not like a hero um, so i do think it's really important that um, fantasy sci-fi or, or genre fiction in, in general um, gives us characters that um, can inspire us all um, and I, I think that's that's really started to happen over the last couple of years like i do think we're in quite a golden age of fantasy at the moment um, where the canon's really opening up and a lot of really cool different types of stories are getting told um i have a thing that's not so much a question as just me saying a part of the book that i really liked but it does sort of dovetail quite well into a question about um heroes and villains that we do have for you but leading up to that yeah. there is a point sometimes when i'm reading a book and there's a line of dialogue or just words that really strike um, a note with me i have to write them down and when i was reading your book i had to stop to write down i hope this isn't a spoiler <laughs> if, if, if this is a spoiler then we'll, we'll edit it out afterwards but there's a line that says um what you were is not as important as what you are or as important as what you could be and um that really like oh i like that might have become that might be my you know affirmation now i feel like <laughs> um it's the, the concept of who you are not being like written in stone because of the past and not being as important as the possibilities of the future is really powerful to me and it feels like it sort of is at the heart of what this novel is about so that was just me saying I really liked that bit and also wondering was that a starting point for you or did you come to that whilst writing the book? Um, I'm, I'm so um, happy that you responded to that line. Um, I, um, it's something that I guess the book is exploring is the idea of like what is the impact of the past on us and how much do we have to be defined by the past. Um, I, I think that that's a theme that probably goes through all my work it's something that i'm really interested in um but but i do think you know what's important about history is that we learn from it and grow and move forward um not that we wear it like a chain around our necks you know dragging us down so that we can never grow um and um and i um i think in the present moment as well like uh, i th i think one thing i've noticed um as we all spend more and more time online during the pandemic is that the internet has a really weird way of collapsing time um, something that happened 10 years ago is just as present as something that is happening right now um but um so i'm uh, uh which is something that i i really resist like I, I like the idea that um people are always growing and that people have a potential in them that to move to move past you know um the troubles of their past, maybe um, things that they were wrong about. Um, my personal approach is always to be, you know, generous towards growth or signs of growth in someone. I think that's really important. Um, mm. The times when people have been generous to me in that way have been just some of the most um, wonderful experiences that I've had. So, um, so yeah, that that line I guess meant quite a lot to me as well. So I'm I'm, I'm really glad that it resonated for you. Oh, definitely. Um, I love that so much. Um, I am a person whose favourite characters are always the villains. Um, every single Disney villain is always my favourite character. And when I read books, as soon as I come across a character that is like morally grey or supposed to be the bad guy, I'm like, oh, I love you. Um, something that I love about your writing is how well you write 
villains or morally grey characters, these people that you think are one thing and then they turn out to be like slowly revealed as something different. Um, what do you think kind of draws you towards those morally grey characters and what do you like about them? I think one of the biggest things that draws me to them is um, I my experience of uh, my experience of, of growing up uh, queer through the through the 90s. Uh, it was a time when there was pretty much no queer representation in any media, <laughs> but certainly almost none in genre fiction and certainly zero among the heroes of genre fiction. <laughs> but what there was, was an awful lot of queer coded villains. Um, so everywhere that I saw myself or reflections of myself, it was in, in a villain. Um, and you name check Disney, like every single Disney villain is queer coded. Scar, Ursula, Jafar, yes, Maleficent. Totally. <laughs> um, the <laughs> list just goes on and on and on. There, there's, there's no queer Disney hero, but every single Disney villain is queer. Um, but it had sort of a weird effect on me, like instead of maybe it misfired, instead of it making me hate myself or hate being queer, it just made me love villains. <laughs> and um, <laughs> And when, because those were the characters that um, I was empathizing with, I had this yearning towards them or this urge of, of um, seeing the hero always cut them down or seeing them always killed or overthrown. Um, my child self felt really like, but just give them a chance. Don't you understand? There's something, <laughs> they're human too. There's something more to them. Um, and so I was, I think I, it just made me, uh, that's the perspective that I'm thrown into inevitably um, when I when I read fantasy and science fiction. Um, I, I remember when I read Harry Potter. Um, I was I I was waiting the whole series for Slytherins to become morally ambiguous, morally grey, with the exception of Snape. That never really happened, and I was devastated at the end when every Slytherin <laughs> followed Voldemort. Um, I uh, it was it was almost a in disbelief, and I just I wanted to explore like those forgotten perspectives um, because I think, as I said, I think it's possible for someone cast as a villain to do something heroic and grow and become something different at, at a certain moment in time, and I think it's it's also possible for so-called heroes to do terrible things as well. So I'm interested in those shades of grey and and um, and playing around in that space. And you, and you explored yes. it so well in this story. I think I was thinking about it afterwards and I think part of part of the appeal for me, or I don't know, probably in, to some respect universally for people in an anti-hero is that none of us, I mean, you know, discounting megalomaniacs and stuff, none of us, I don't think truly believe that we're hero material. Right. So when you see someone who has started out definitely not hero material make that hero's journey it really like i don't know it satisfies some core longing in yourself to be better or to subvert ex expectations that people have of you oh, um, yeah. yeah i love the way you put that and i absolutely agree i have like it's me it's really difficult to not talk about spoilers in this podcast but i am controlling myself you have pretty much answered this question already. I think it's it's clear that you're you were writing towards uh, an ending where you wanted to subvert some stereotypes. Um, but I just wanted to know because when something's so intricately done and it feels like your reveals and the move the movements towards the conclusion of this book are so grand scale and intricate, I always need to know like was the ending always super clear in your mind and you wrote towards it like with how what to what level do you plan everything out and to what level did you sort of discover right yes i'm 100 percent a planner and this book was planned down to the last iota i was <laughs> writing towards the last line on the last page for pretty much the the whole book so um uh i think in in a way dark rise started with that ending and then it was about writing the best book uh to kind of 
create that kind of one-two setup payoff <laughs> um, so that uh, it would land as powerfully as I could make it land. Um, I, I've got a lot of friends who are writers and they really talk about, they love, you know, writing the feeling of discovery and um, that if they know what happens, then they it lose that freshness that pulls them through and they lose the joy of writing. And I don't feel that at all. Like the <laughs> unknown is not exciting to me. It's just terrifying. If I don't know what's going to happen in my book, I just get this churning, horrible sensation. Um, I like to um, plan everything, know every um, aspect of the book and then begin to write manuscript. I'm such a slow writer as well that if I was finding the book through a drafting process, it would it would take me honestly a, a decade to write a novel. So it's much more economical as well as less terrifying to um, to plan everything um, in the in the plotting stage. Um, but um, but I think you know uh, <laughs> we talked about Tolkien. I, I look, I feel so um, envious of him in a way, his, his writing, the way he was allowed to write a book for 30 years with no distractions of the internet and no interruptions. And he wrote the entire trilogy as one, um, didn't write book one, have it published and then move forward to write book two as we do in the modern publishing age. Mm -hmm. um, and um, planning the whole thing, when you, and when you write as everything as a whole, you know, you you can seed things at the beginning of book one that will pay off uh, at the end of book three. You know, the Chekhov's gun that goes off at the very end of the series. Um, since I can't write the entire thing <laughs> um, from beginning to end before publishing, but what I can do is plan the whole thing. Um, and it will, it will allow me to have those, um, those repeated, those kind of, uh, uh, yes, yeah, setups and, and payoffs that will hopefully kind of keep, uh, I've buried the mines that will hopefully keep going off throughout the rest of the trilogy. I'm too excited. <laughs> Knowing that you've planned everything out, like to the last detail like that, it actually like gives me butterflies. I love when you hear an author, like they know exactly what they're doing. And you obviously like, when I was reading, um, I reread, I reread Dark Rise like last night and reading it knowing how it turns out when you go back in and you see those little things that are seeded throughout it's so cleverly done um it was that's, not a, that's it not was a question <laughs> it was all there if yeah. you just looked <laughs> um i love that so much um i i just wanted to ask a little bit of a fun question um as i was reading this i kept thinking about how like cinematic it felt to me um and it was very visual um, and I think something like this would translate really well to the screen. I just wondered if you'd had any kind of thoughts, like in a perfect world, what kind of like actors and actresses would you want to cast in a movie oh adaptation gosh. of Dark Rise? Um, wait, can I throw that back on you? Who would you cast in Timothy oh Chalamet my gosh. as well? <laughs> Timothy. <laughs> Timothy Chalamet as well. Timothy Chalamet as well. <laughs> oh, he does have that like um super aesthetic look, doesn't he? The cheekbones and the dark hair and the fair skin. Yeah, yes. the only thing is, I guess he's a bit, uh, probably a bit aged out of the character, but I don't know, I would buy it. Or Isn't he playing, um, he's playing Paul from Dune, right? He's playing a 15 year old right now. Yeah. Surely he can play so a 16 year old in five years. <laughs> yeah. He has a very youthful face. I think he could yeah. pull it off. Yeah. I would, I, I mentally cast him when I was reading it. There's a few descriptions of Will where I was just like, yeah, that, that's, some Chalamet vibes. <laughs> I don't know who you would get to play James. That that's beyond me. You get some kind of um, you get some kind of British actor. I think that they, you know, they they just churn out those <laughs> those um, you know those blonde kind of overbred <laughs> English actors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with the, the Oxbridge accents over there, don't they? There'll, there'll be some young up and comer that will fit the bill there. I have to be an unknown. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, well, we've, we've had the warning that we've, we've gone a little bit over time, so we'll have to kind of start wrapping it up, much as I don't really want to. Um, you've tantalisingly mentioned the planning that you've done for the series, but I don't know, it, it have, has it been announced yet? Do you know how many books it will be? 
Uh, I'm not sure that that's been announced, but I okay. think it's sort of, yeah, I'll just say that that has not yet been announced, but it, it's <laughs> a roughly planned as a trilogy, I believe. Cool. Okay. And are you, are you able to tell us, is the next book in the series what's coming up next for you, or do you have any other stuff um, going on? So the next book in the series is, is my next book, um, but um, and I can't say too much about the other projects that I'm working on because they're all um, they're all just top secret. But <laughs> um, but there is um, also something Captive Prince related in the works, which um, has been in the works for now <laughs> several years during the COVID hiatus. Oh my um, gosh. There's some more, um, there's more volumes of Fence that will be coming out, I think, next year, early next year. Um, and then there's a, there's a new something that I can't talk about at all. All I can say is that I'm very excited about it and I'm writing in a form that I've never written in before. Wow. Oh goodness. How's that for a mysterious tease? I like it. <laughs> Uh, we will look forward to hearing more about all of those things. Uh, so Kat, I'd like to thank you so much for your time today and for chatting with us. It's been so amazing. And thank you so much for having me. This has been really, really fun. You're welcome back anytime. Um, and everyone listening, you can grab your copy of Dark Rise by CS the Cat at your local bookstore or online at Booktopia. Thanks for listening and never stop reading. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces and more. Or if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, Australia's local bookstore at booktopia.com.au.